Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're talking about iOS application development with Backendless. Uh, if you don't know uh, anything about Backendless uh, or Backend as a service in general, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview uh, uh, about uh, about Backendless and uh, Backend as a service, just so you you have an idea. So if we if we think about how client-server applications are developed. Uh, you know, it consists of the client side, and there is a server side, and the client side is where uh, is what what the users see. So it's whatever is running on the, I I mean, uh, phones, uh, tablets, or browser, and there is a server side. And on the server side, traditionally, it really is the same kind of set of functionality. And whether it is interaction with the uh, with the database, uh, handling SQL queries, putting the data in, getting the data out. Uh, or let's say uh, managing users, user registrations or logins, uh, handling password recovery, sending out emails for uh, for email confirmation, uh, handling file uploads, connecting to message queues. So all of that functionality traditionally resides on the server. And if you think about it, uh, from application to application, it is going to be pretty much exactly the same code. So if you, if it is file upload. It's going to be the same file upload regardless what that application is. If it is uh, sending out messages through an MQ system, whether it's ActiveMQ, MSMQ, doesn't really matter. It's going to be pretty much the same code. If you connect to Q and you subscribe and you broadcast messages, once again, same kind of code. Clearly, business logic is going to be different. But from the actual uh, plumbing perspective, connecting to various enterprise systems or databases or MQ systems, it's going to be the same code. So, um, uh, and if since everybody is looking for ways to optimize your development, make it faster, uh, make sure that you can get applications done, uh, developed, and delivered to your customers at a fraction of the time, there's got to be ways to optimize overall application development. And this is exactly where backend as a service comes into play. Uh, the idea uh, behind backend as a service is that you take the, the, the common functionality, the one that is present on the server side, uh, once again, database connectivity, user management, handling file uploads, video uh, or an audio streaming, this, this is common functionality. If you take all of those functions and you package them as services and expose that functionality via APIs, then you basically could have a universal backend that can be customized from application to application, but you save tremendous amount of time because you don't have to spend time on those routine functions and that routine code that is pretty much the same across the board. And that's exactly what backend as a service is. Taking all the common functionality, exposing it as services, so you can build applications without worrying about server-side coding at all, or very minimal server-side coding if you ever have to use that functionality. So to summarize, uh, a backendless is a development and runtime platform. You can develop apps with it. Uh, and once you've created your application, regardless whether it's a mobile app or a desktop app, you put it out there uh, and uh, and backend as a service, or backendless in this case, uh, becomes your backend. So it's also a runtime platform because it powers the life of your application. Uh, once again, Server-side coding is not required. You can actually build a variety of different applications without touching the server side by basically shifting uh, the business logic on the client side. However, there are certainly scenarios where server-side code is required or needed. And uh, this is something we're working on and uh, we will be uh, opening up that feature. And we did it in a very, very cool way that actually provides a way to uh, complement your application with server-side coding in any language, regardless if you like to write code in COBOL, you will be able to do it with backends. But uh, primarily, it is going to be JavaScript with Node.js and Java. Uh, but uh, as far as .NET, PHP, there is also going to be a possibility to extend your apps with service-side code. Uh, so all the services are, I mean, all the functionality is exposed as, as, as services, so it is a server-oriented functionality. Uh, from the backendless perspective, there are, the, we, we see our product consisting of basically two components. One, it is the API, so that those are the endpoints and then actual APIs 
to uh, work with your data, to work with your users, to work with messages, video, and so on. Uh, and there is a developer council, and we will review both uh, in this presentation today, specifically from the iOS perspective. As far as the libraries, uh, which we uh, package those APIs and make available to developers, uh, there you can see a list of them right here. And we try to expand the list of supported clients to basically cover all major client-side environments. All right, uh, so let's uh, let's review what those services are uh, that backend list consists of, and uh, I will demonstrate various uh, iOS apps, uh, some in the simulator some uh, on a device i have uh, have a, an ipad here ready to to deploy some samples and demonstrate uh how they work to you so first of all and, and by the way just to remind you right guys if you have any questions feel free to type them up here uh by the way before we start i see there is a question uh it says that we released media for ios and air will javascript follow soon uh, it's an, that's an excellent question. Let me answer this question as soon as we get to the audio video streaming part of this presentation. I'll definitely respond uh, what we are doing for other environment, for environments other than iOS, specifically for video and audio streaming. All right. So the very first service uh, da, 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 is, is user management. So user management it's, uh, if you think about it, fairly trivial service. Uh, there, is, there are not that many things that, that your applications do from the user management perspective. It is pretty much boils down to user registration, filling out registration form, entering all the basic data about your users. They, they basically register with your app. You make one method call uh, from the back endless API, users register. Uh, and there is a login. So once the user registers, they can log in and uh, start using your application. Once they log in, inside of your app, you can configure various uh, limitations from the permissions perspective to specify what users can or cannot do. So to start, uh, let me show you an example of user management. Let me just switch to Xcode uh, and uh, run this user service. Uh, by the way, the examples that you're going to see here, they are actually available as a part of the uh, SDK that we provide for iOS. Uh, but I'm just going to do a service for you to, to show them how it works. And if you're interested, you can take a look at the code and play and uh, uh, work with them yourself. So first of all, let's register a user. And uh, let's call this user Mark, some password that I can remember. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five. And let's say the email is going to be iOS test at backendless.com. Uh, there is also another field which is the gender that is male and click register. So now a request goes out, as you can see right here in the debug screen, to backendless. This user is being registered. Um, we just actually did a did an upgrade on the server, so some things have not been entirely cached, so there is a little bit of delay. But anyway, the user now is registered. So uh, and now is a good opportunity to switch to console and see what it actually happened from the backend perspective. So first of all, uh, if you click on the users icon in the in the console, and then this console basically right now represents my app, and I have the app that I created. It's called Cool App. Creating an application is is trivial. You can just click on Create App button, uh, type in the name, and your server side of that application is ready. So here. In the users section, if we go to user properties, you see all of these properties, okay? Now these properties, they I didn't have to type them up here. They just showed up. Uh, Backendless automatically creates all the properties uh, from the registration call. So as you develop, you don't have to go and mess with console. You can actually just, by expressing all the registration fields in your code and sending a registration request into Backendless, the registration fields will automatically be uh, derived from that. But you can tweak them, change the data type, or you can add additional fields, specify which one represents the identity, which is very important because identity is used to log in your users. Uh, so you can uh, provide default value and so on. So now that I have registered that user, you can actually see all your registered users. Um, if you go to data and select users, uh, then right here, if I go, I think, to the second screen, there's going to be this uh, iOS test user somewhere here. Here it is, iOS test, this column right here. So we see that that user has registered. Now, if we go back to users, under registration, notice that I have 
enabled require email confirmation, okay? Which means that if I go back to my simulator and try to log in, you see this iOS test that all this information is still here. If I click log in, that request will fail because that user has not confirmed their email address yet. And that email address uh, must be confirmed, and see user cannot be logged in, must be confirmed because we in enabled uh, requirement for the email confirmation. So if I go back to my mail client and uh, uh, see the confirmation template right here, so that email was sent out by Backendless with a link. So if I click this link and confirm my email address, then uh, it is now confirmed. And if I go back to the application and try to log in, then we are now successfully logged in. So uh, I know that it sounded like there's a lot, but it's actually fairly trivial if you try it yourself. But the amount of code that this simple operation has uh, replaced is huge. So there is a lot of code that, that was automatically cut out that you can just leverage uh, in, inside of your application. Okay, so that's that's user management. Let me show you from the from the code perspective what it actually means. So if I switch to Xcode and here's my user uh, user service. Uh, first and foremost, there are two keys that you have to copy and paste into your application to you, which uniquely identify your app. So first of all, it is application ID and secret key. Uh, back in, uh, in the console, if you go and click on manage, under app settings, here are all the keys for various environments. Application ID uniquely identifies your app. Uh, secret key. Uh, there is one for all major environments, including REST, uh, and, but here we're talking about iOS, so here's the secret key for the iOS apps. And you just copy and paste them into your code. Uh, then uh, when application starts, it's very important to initialize your app, and for that you use backendless uh, init app function, which basically just initializes your application. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So from the uh, API perspective, let's say registration, uh, it's also just a, a one-liner uh, to register the user. So here it is, uh, backendless user service register. And you specify the user object, which must be an instance of backendless user. And very similar with login. So from the API, most of the APIs are really just one-liners. And it's very easy to use. Uh, so that was, that was user service. And uh, let's move on. Uh, once again, here, just a, an example of how to handle login. Um, let's talk about data service. So data service is your, it's, that's your persistent storage. Pretty much every single application that I have seen out there or I worked on, and I know a lot of people are developing, they require some sort of persistent storage. The way data service works with backendless is uh, you work with, with your objects. So you do not need to worry about schema creation or, or figuring out how to you know, write views or store procedures or SQL or whatever. You basically just have an object that you need to persist. You make a call, the data goes out into backendless and is stored in the in the storage. Uh, in, on the backendless side, uh, if there is no table that can accommodate that particular object, a table is created on the fly. All the columns in the table will be derived automatically from the properties of the object that you save. Let me show you an example. Uh, which basically demonstrates this particular concept. So for this, I have this to-do data application. And let me run it real quick in my simulator. Uh, while it is doing this, if you guys have any questions about user service, which we just reviewed, please uh, let me know. Uh, keep sending your questions into, into the GoToMeeting control panel. All right, so here it is. Uh, this is a very basic to-do application. So in, in this case, uh, I can just say, let's say, conduct a webinar, which is what I'm doing right now. So now we created a task, and this task is out there. Uh, let's say, pick up kids from school. So now we have three tasks in our storage. If we go back to console, and select data, you see this task. Uh, table because the class that I'm storing is called task. It contains exactly these three uh, items. And right here, if I select, let's say, uh, let's say I picked up my kids from school, it updated it. And let's say I want to delete it. 
by refreshing this table, I see there are only two tasks left. So it, the, the storage is out there, it's synchronized with your application. And uh, uh, from the API perspective, it works at the code level. So here, if I take a look at the to-do data, you see that here's my task class. It contains all of these properties. Uh, name is the one that we actually work with. Uh, and from the API perspective, you have APIs to save, to update, to delete, and there is a querying API. Uh, selecting data from the persistent storage, we do support uh, basically SQL 92 query language, so you can actually get quite elaborate on how you want to retrieve the data. Uh, and it's basically just the where clause that corresponds and works with the properties for a particular table. Uh, Backendless data service also supports related uh, properties. So you could have a complex type that references other complex types. And uh, you can just, with a single call, store sort of the parent object, and then all the related child, uh, all the related children will automatically be stored in the corresponding tables. And the same thing is true for retrieving data from, from, the, uh, from the persistent storage. Going back to the console, here you can, mo uh, you can actually mod modify and work with schema. Uh, so here, all the properties that we have here, name is the one that we actually store. Uh, we automatically determine that it was string, but you can create additional columns. Just click on add column, specify the column name, and uh, it will just become a part of your schema. Uh, versioning is also one, one uh, a very important uh, feature. So let's say you developed an application and released it out there. It is in the app store, and you have some data that the application works with. And you started working on version two. So for your entities, let's say you expanded them and uh, created additional columns, uh, but you want those columns, all the new data, all the basically new facets of your data to be available in version two. Uh, back analysts can handle this uh, scenario easily because what you do is you specify that which new columns are available in the current version. Right now, my current version is V1 right here. But which and then which columns are basically shared with the previous version? So right here, I see the sharing with version right here applies to uh, to various columns, and they can be uh, either shared or completely independent. If the column is shared, then any data that you have accumulated in version one will be available in version two, exactly the same, and vice versa. But if they're not, uh, well, actually, vice versa is not true because if something is new in version two, version one doesn't see it. And that's that's handled that completely transparently for you. Uh, as far as security, you can assign permissions. Let's say with roles, there are two built-in roles on not authenticated user and authenticated. You can add your own roles as there and specify what each individual role can or cannot do, thus restricting access to uh, to the specific uh, operations based on the. Uh, role or for specific users. So if you go to user prep permissions, you'll see a list of the users that you can customize permissions for. All right, so that's data service. Uh, you can actually create tables, delete tables, pretty much uh, do uh, the entire data management directly from, from your console. All right, that's, that's kind of an overview of the data service. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Uh, let's move on. So right here, this is a, this is an example of uh, saving an instance. So here, just to review, we created a, create an instance of the person class, populate properties, obtain the data storage for our person class, and just call save and specify the object that we want to save. Okay. Um, the next one is audio and video streaming and recording. So that's a it's a very exciting service. Uh, literally without any, practically any effort, or definitely without any effort on the server side, you can uh, stream a live video from your iPhones and iPads. Uh, other users can uh, tune in and, and start streaming those live broadcasts into their devices or computers, uh, browsers, uh, and consume uh, that information. Creating a video chat is actually very straightforward. We're finishing up a sample application which we will be publishing and all the source code for uh, that demonstrates how to do live uh, video and audio chat. Uh, an example that I have put together here uh, demonstrates an ability to record sort of a video note and then just play it back. Uh, let me switch to Xcode. And this one is gonna be video service. 
I'm going to run it on my uh, device because on the simulator camera is not available. So I'm going to uh, run it on my iPad here. Let me just start it up. Uh, while it is launching, uh, I'm going to show you what I have, uh, what we have in the media service. So here's the media service. You can see a list of all the recorded streams. Uh, and then those recorded streams could actually be uploaded as files. You can upload MP4s, FLVs, and so on. Uh, and FLV is a, is a flash media format, which we uh, have uh, a library that allows you to play it on, on, on iOS devices without uh, with, with just native code. But anyway, so here, um, hopefully you can see it. And in, in, in go to webinar control panel, there is a, a webcam section. So if you open that, you will be able to see what I have here on the screen. And uh, what I have here is an application. I think we get a little bit of glare. Let me try to find it. There you go. So here, uh, there is a, this is an example. And from this example, I can click publish. There's a publish button and there is a playback. So publish will record a video and upload it out there into back endless. And then with playback, I can just stream uh, that video. So I'm clicking publish. Uh, it switches to, uh, to to the video camera, so I'm going to record myself saying, "Hey guys, uh, we're conducting an iOS uh, webinar uh, showing uh, video streaming capabilities for Backendless." So I click stop, and this stream is now available on Backendless. Uh, in fact, let me just right here in, in media. See, uh, if if we, if we switch to files, there is a there is a media folder. And we'll talk about file service as well. But in the media folder, this is where all the recordings end up. Uh, and uh, right here, here's this little sample, which is basically what I recorded. But if I go back to, uh, to, uh, to my iPad and click playback, you can actually see this is what I just recorded a while back. And uh, it is basically streaming right there from, uh, from the canvas. Okay, And there is an audio there as well. Okay, uh, so that's that's video service, but the capabilities that uh, which exist they are literally unlimited because uh, once again it is support for live broadcasts, uh, recording video on the server. Uh, you can upload static videos using the file service, and as soon as it's uploaded, uh, you can start streaming that video or audio. It could actually be like a radio station or whatever. Uh, uh, so there was a question on uh, on the availability of that API for JavaScript. So right now, the API which we made available for video service is uh, uh, is available. It is available for um, for iOS devices, which is just native Objective C code. Uh, you basically import the libraries that are which are included in the, in our SDK, and you can uh, you can basically start consuming those APIs. And it's also available for Adobe Air. So with Adobe Air, you can build Air apps, uh, which could be deployed on mobile devices or in the browser, but that requires a Flash plugin. But on the on the on the devices, it is compiled as a native application. So as far as other environments, uh, which uh, other client-side environments, we're definitely looking into the possibility to expand support for audio and video streaming for Android, Windows Phone, JavaScript. Uh, right now, the biggest challenge is uh, is basically broadcasting video, so tapping into a microphone and camera and sending out a stream. Consuming the video is not a, is not a problem, especially if it is on demand video. So, for example, with JavaScript using HTML5 capabilities, getting that video stream and playing it on a device is something we can do today. We don't advertise or document the capability, but we technically can do it. Uh, streaming live video from from JavaScript is, is is something is a challenge that we haven't figured out yet, but we're working on it. But I think it's a it's a challenge that is uh, is present industry wise, uh, industry wide. So if you guys uh, have any ideas about that or have any questions, uh, I'd love to talk about it as well. But anyway, that's uh, that's uh, that's audio and video. Um, just to review in the console when you go to v, uh, to media. There are two categories. There is recorded media, which is your static recorded content. There is online streams. So if I were to start, let's say, video chat or start broadcasting uh, some uh, something from my devices, you'll see a list of all the uh, videos that are being uh, broadcast right right at this moment. For every for any stream 
you can actually uh, start playing it right from the console and it will show what's going on for the management perspective. So you'll be able to interrupt that stream, delete it, and so on. And there is a variety of different things that we're planning to actually make it more like a control panel in a, in a, a TV studio, so to speak, where you can do various things with, with streams. So a lot of interesting things are going to be coming up in the near future. Uh, for recorded media, uh, let's say uh, if, if I upload a file, uh, once again, in the file, uh, file section, there is a media folder and I uploaded some files. So if I go here and just click on a particular uh, file, it's just going to start playing it. And here it is, uh, a little video that you see on the screen uh, for a static on-demand content. So you can basically preview pretty much anything uh, that is being deployed into your application. Uh, from the security perspective, what we did is there is a concept of a tube, and tube is like a category. And then when you go into permissions, uh, you can select a particular tube and restrict access of to, uh, for uh, who can see videos uh, in that tube, who can publish uh, either at the user level or at the roles level. So you can definitely restrict uh, uh, permissions of, for who can record or play or add media or remove media um, and so on. All right, uh, so that's the audio and video support uh, for Backendless. Uh, here's an, uh, a little example from the code perspective. Uh, to publish a stream, there is one line of code. Uh, it takes care of everything, just connecting to your camera, to your microphone, starting streaming. Uh, here you identify the name of your video stream, the name of the tube that it's going to go into, uh, and that's pretty much it. So very, very easy to use APIs. It is fully documented now. We just uploaded a set of API documentation to our site so you can see a bunch of examples in the actual API and see exactly how it works. Um, so file service, we sort of touched on the file service uh, and uh, I showed you what it looks like in the console, but and essentially it is the file storage that is attached to your application. Uh, working with files is very common for a lot of different apps, whether they are images or uh, any kind of static content, or let's say if you're building a, a job search service, could be resumes, could really be anything. Uh, you can upload files. There is an API for that. You can upload files uh, right from the console. Uh, you can upload files with, with Git. You know, the file storage that Backendless has has a Git interface, so you can just commit and push changes. Uh, so there's versioning clearly. You can commit push changes, you can pull from the Git, the Git repository. So all the things that are traditional with Git are entirely applicable here as well. Uh, there is an example that I have for uh, for file service, which is um, kind of interesting. So let me run it real quick and show you how it works. So for this, you just select file service. Um, I'm going to run it on my iPad. And the way this example works is I can take a picture uh, on the device uh, it, will, it is uploaded uh, into the backendless application, and I can just browse it from, from anywhere. So now uh, this example is starting up right here. You can see uh, there are two buttons. Uh, well, you can see it here. There's a button, Take Photo. And on this example, and I mean, here I can just let me flip the camera. So I'm going to take a photo of uh, my screen right here. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, a little bit of glare. Actually, I can just take a photo of it looks like this uh, and right here i can just use it and the photo is being uploaded so here it is i click upload this photo is being uploaded into my application as soon as this photo is uploaded uh, every single file gets its own url so you can share this url with other people uh, and uh, in fact here it is uh, i know it's kind of hard to see but right here you see the URL. But uh, to see this photo, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run exactly the same example in the simulator. It is iPhone simulator. And then uh, this example also includes the browsing capability. So I can just browse all the photos which were uploaded. So if I click browse uploaded, so here it is. This is the photo that I just took with my iPad. If I click on it, so here it is. So you can actually see uh, my monitor with right there with a little video image. But that photo is out there. In fact, if I go to console and uh, select files, and this test folder is where we uploaded those photos to. Oh, actually, no, it's not test folder. It is going to be maybe IMG. Yeah, here it is. 
So if I click on it, here it is. Here's the photo that I just took from, from my iPad, but it's already a part of your server-side application. Very trivial app, but it, I think it shows up a lot of different opportunities and possibilities that you can use the file storage for, uh, backendless file storage for your applications. And the API for file storage is universal, so it is available across the board for all kinds of different apps. So if you're building an app uh, for an iPhone or iPad and uh, sort of a corresponding app in JavaScript, then those two can easily talk to each other and exchange information. Uh, API, simple API, there is an upload API, there is a delete API, so you can actually do some basic things with the files that you're uploading. All right, uh, let's see. And here's an example of how to handle an upload in Objective-C. Uh, the next example is geolocation. So geolocation, uh, if you are building uh, applications which are location aware, uh, meaning that you need to do searches for, uh, allow, allow users to do searches in the area where they are at for other things like places of interest, or if you're building, let's say, a dating app, and you can, uh, we actually put together an example which we'll be releasing fairly soon. It's called Matchmaker, uh, Endless Matchmaker. And in there, you can specify, uh, basically fill out a profile and say, well, I like uh, French food and I like uh, shopping and I like to play basketball. So this is kind of my profile. And I'm a male, I'm looking for, for females. And then uh, the opposite uh, gender uh, girls fill out the profile. So if there is a match, it basically shows those profiles in the same geographic area and then establishes, uh, allows people to establish a connection. So it's like, like a primitive matchmaker. But that's exactly a, a very good uh, usage for uh, our geolocation service in this particular app, because in there, it will show me all other uh, uh, people in this case that are located in my geographic area where there is a match. Now, the cool thing is that that match between different profiles is also implemented through geolocation. The way we did it is uh, anytime you put a geo point, basically a point with coordinates into, uh, into backendless, you can attach additional metadata. And that metadata can be absolutely anything. It could be, it is essentially a key value pair. So uh, in, in that matchmaker example, what we did is, the key value pairs is like cuisine, French, sports, uh, volleyball, uh, I don't know, favorite leisure time, reading, whatever. It, it could be anything. And whenever you run searches inside of the geolocation service, you can basically say, find matches for this particular profile. And those matches could be relative. It could say, well, for cuisine, it is 100% match. For something else, it is less. So overall profile match could be 80%. And that kind of search is built in. You don't have to worry about any of the algorithmic analysis to actually find those matches. That's what geolocation service does for you. Uh, there is an ex whenever you create an application, we populate the system with uh, with some sample data, which looks like this. So there is a geolocation screen, and in there uh, you basically get a get a map with various points of interest. So right here. Uh, and then all the geo points, they, uh, they belong to categories. In this case, it is called geo service sample category. Every single point includes latitude, longitude, which is basic coordinates, and metadata, as I just described. In this particular case, metadata is very simple. It is uh, key is city, value is Dallas. So uh, to run an application on top of this, there is one. I'm going to do it next. Let me select geolocation geo service run it in the simulator and in this case uh, it will determine uh, coordinates of where i am and i can specify the radius so right here these are my coordinates uh, there is a default radius and uh, it go a request goes out to the canvas to actually find all the other cities within in this case uh, the specified radius which is like 2000 kilometers and there are a lot of cities but if we go smaller there's going to be so here it is that's that's what within 1,000 miles, 1,000 kilometers from where Dallas is, which is where I am. Uh, so there is no mapping to the actual uh, map, which could be basically a function of the client side, but a uh, point in action that you can actually run geo searches within radius uh, and, and also attach metadata to it. So that's our geo service. Uh, as far as adding data into your application, you can do it directly from the console. Under more, there is import. So here you basically find a CSV file that contains all the geo points with metadata and categories and uh, upload it into your app and you can start doing searches. So that's, that's geolocation. 
uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll actually just review the API. So here you specify the handless query, you specify the, the, the metadata, which we want to match, and just one get points function, and it brings all the data back. Uh, to continue, publish subscribe messaging, a very powerful functionality uh, and simple concept. Uh, you have publisher, basically a, a program that can send out messages into into backendless and you have subscribers which subscribe and tune in to receive data from backendless uh, uh, and it's not that it could it, it sounds simple but there could be a lot of different variations where you subscribe you can say well i'm not interested in all the data i want only a certain subset that matches these qualities and you describe those qualities with uh, with basically a query and those qualities, once again, they're headers, like attached metadata to your to your objects, and they could be anything like, let's say, importance, high, uh, or uh, let's say, area that this particular message impacts, Dallas or New York or whatever. When you subscribe, you basically say, I want high importance messages that, that are related to Dallas, and you're going to get only those messages. Another example of uh, using publish subscribe messaging could be chat, like text chat, which is uh, which is probably the most common usage of public subscribe messaging. Uh, and uh, let me show you how that work, how that works. Pop up chat, run it. And in this case, you could have really uh, unlimited number of devices connected and uh, users chatting with each other. Uh, but let me show you. So here, let me say this is my name is going to be Mark. Start chat. So uh, this app connects to Backendless, uh, establishes a channel, and uh, uh, on the server side, if we go to messaging, so this is a list of the channels that we have. Uh, so now this app has started, and I'm going to say, hi there, press enter, so the message goes out. Uh, notice that in the console right here, my default channel is selected, and I have this message, hi there. So uh, I can respond back and say that this is going to be says admin, for, for instance. Click publish. You see this message was sent. Hi there. I mean, hello. And uh, it, it also is displayed in the application. And uh, uh, the API, once again, is universal. So creating an app uh, for iOS and for Android, which are chatting together, is going to be fairly trivial. It's, it's, it's very easy to do. Uh, but the the applicability of that api for other uh, use cases including enterprise is is very large you can do a lot of different things with published subscribe message so that's uh that's that's it as far as this demo uh there is also an ability to specify subtopics and various headers right here or send them out as push notifications and speaking of push notifications this is the next subject i actually don't have a demo unfortunately prepared because i ran out of time to just put it all in place but uh, in the SDK there is an example for push notifications which you can uh, uh, run yourself uh, and the way it works you have to configure provisioning profile that includes push notifications and in console if you go to manage and uh, under app settings you have to upload your uh, certificate file into backendless and specify the certificate password so uh, back analysts can work with Apple notification service to do push notifications. And this is exactly the part that I didn't have time to, to prepare, I apologize. Uh, but the example is definitely with the source code. Uh, push notifications are very powerful. Uh, back analyst supports push notifications for all major three providers. Uh, that is uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft with Windows Phone, and uh, Google for Android devices. Uh, the API is exactly the same. So with the same API, you can actually deliver push notifications to all the devices uh, where your application runs. Or you can trim it down and say, well, this push notification goes out only to iOS devices or goes out only to iOS devices that have subscribed to certain channels. So you, you can actually start doing some additional intelligent filtering for broadcasting push notifications. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very powerful functionality. We're gonna we're gonna do a separate webinar dedicated just to push notifications. I believe it is two weeks from now. Take a look at the calendar uh, on the on the webinar schedule on our site. You'll see it in there. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna skip it because I don't have really an example to show uh, a running example to show. Uh, and uh, that's that. Uh, here's an example of basically delivering push notification, but. 
that's pretty much it as far as the actual demos that I have prepared for you. Uh, and uh, I'd love to take any questions.